So yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about functional neuroimaging in the era of big data and open science. And so there's a couple of terms that uh, first I'd like to define. So first of all, what is open science? This is something that's talked about a lot these days, um, but it's not always clear what people mean by it. So I've pulled two definitions. One is from the mission statement of the Center for Open Science. So the Center for Open Science is in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's a leading research institute um, for these issues of open science. And their mission statement says their mission is to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. So we're gonna be talking a lot today about those issues, um, in particular openness and reproducibility. So that's another term that's gonna to have to be defined because different people use it in different ways. NASA also has an open science initiative. Um, they call it the open source science initiative. So it's a little bit of a different emphasis here. And from their website, you can see that what they're talking about is a commitment to the open sharing of software, data, and knowledge, which includes algorithms, papers, documents, all the ancillary information that goes into research as early as possible in the scientific process. So when I talk about open science here today, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this movement to share research and all of its associated products as early as possible in the process. I'm gonna be doing it in the context of a particular type of neuroimaging data, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. Um, and I'm using this as an example, both of big data, and I'll explain why it's big data and how it's big data. And also as an example of an area of science where there have been issues raised about reproducibility and replicability and where open science has started to take hold as a potential remedy to some of the problems. So first I'm gonna start with a little bit of an introduction to functional MRI itself. The data are really interesting from a statistical point of view. And so um, when I first started working in this area more than 20 years ago, I thought, oh, you know, this will just be like a project I'll work on for a little while, but I've been doing it for more than 20 years and the questions keep coming. So fMRI is a non-invasive way of studying brain function. By non-invasive, I mean that, for instance, we're not sticking electrodes into the brain. We're not injecting a radioactive tracer to the subject. We're just, we're just doing something that is non-invasive in this way. And because it's non-invasive, it is one of the most popular neuroimaging techniques that exists today and really has revolutionized the way that we both um, do studies of the human brain and think about um, cognitive functioning. But it doesn't give us a direct measure of neuronal activity. The only way to get that direct measure would be to stick electrodes into the brain. This is not what we do. We get an indirect measure. And the most common way that we do this, there are, there are different ways that you can get the MR image. But when people talk about fMRI and you read you know, in the New York Times or, on, or in Science or Nature or wherever you might read about some imaging study, almost certainly they're using something that is called the blood oxygenation level dependent or bold response. And I'll explain what that is as well. So this is what the scanner looks like. The MR scanner, if you've ever had a medical MRI, you've probably been inside one a machine that looks pretty much like this. Um, there's a couple of pieces that are important to pay attention to that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. So first off is the magnet. So the magnet itself is a very, very powerful magnet, thousands of times more powerful than the Earth's natural magnetic field, okay? And so this is why if you've ever had an, been in a situation where you need an MRI, they'll ask, for instance, do you have any metal um, implants or anything, pins, whatever. If you do, you can't go inside the machine because it's a really powerful magnet. The pieces of the system that allow us to get the functional images are these two pieces here, the gradient coils and the radio frequency coil. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happens when a subject or patient is put inside the machine. So they go inside this very powerful magnet and we apply um, what are called the gradient coils and the radio frequency coils to get the signal. So here's a little cartoon of how this works. So I have a little bit of physics here, um, not too much. So in a normal situation, 
we're here. So right now, all of us are in this situation A. The atoms inside our body are just spinning around, each one around its own axis, around its own direction, each in their individual way. Then you go inside the scanner, this very powerful magnet, it has the effect of aligning all of the atom spins in the direction of the magnet. So if you think about this bottle here being the magnet, when I go inside, then now all of my atoms are aligned this way with the direction of the magnet, right? And you can see that some of them are facing one way, some of them are facing another way, that's okay. They're all spinning and they're doing their thing, but now they're all in sync. They're all coordinated and they're all in the direction of the magnet. The next step is that we apply these radio frequency pulses. So if we go back to the previous slide, we see these radio frequency coils. These are the things that allow us to localize the signal. So we apply the radio frequency pulses. And what that does is it takes those spins that were aligned with the direction of the magnet and knocks them to be perpendicular. And then we take the radio frequency pulse off. And when we take the pulse off, then the atoms are gonna go back to spinning in the direction of the magnet again. And this takes time. It takes different time for different types of molecules, different types of atoms. And the thing that allows us to do the imaging is a little bit of biology. So um, when your brain is involved in some kind of cognitive task, the parts of the brain that are working harder need more oxygen. And so the, so the oxygen, goes to those regions of the brain. And it turns out that oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood re release that energy from the radio frequency pulse and return to stability at different rates, okay? And so as a result of this interplay between the physics of the magnetic system and the biology of the way the brain works, we can actually get this indirect measure. And so it's looking at the sort of the difference in the oxygenated blood, the oxygen rich blood, and the oxygen sort of relatively depleted blood in the different parts of the brain. And that's what allows us to, to get the image. Okay, so it's really an indirect thing, but this is what we can get from the machine. So this is the schematic of what the data look like. And I'll explain again what all of these different pieces are. So. What happens is when you take one of these functional images is you'll be in the scanner over some amount of time and you might be doing some kind of task. So for instance, a simple task might be you're in the scanner and there's a screen in the scanner that you can see and there might be a flashing checkerboard. And so parts of your brain that are responding to that flashing checkerboard are gonna require more oxygen in their blood and we're gonna get an image and the parts of the brain that are responding to the flashing checkerboard are going to have a higher level of that bold response than the parts of the brain that are not. Or if you're reading a sentence and you have to ask, answer a question about it, the parts of your brain that are involved in language processing are going to be how, showing a higher bold response than the parts that are not. The way that the data are collected then is over time, we get a sequence of images. So at time one, the first time we have an image of the whole brain. Second time, we have an image of the whole brain. Up to the very end, and we have an image of the whole brain. Because of the way that the radio frequency pulses are, um, are, are applied within the scanner, the data come out in, basically we have a volume, a three-dimensional volume, a big cube like this, and the cube is split up into these tinier cubes, which are called voxels. You can think about the voxels as a three-dimensional analog of the pixel that you have on your pictures on your camera, okay? But now because it's three-dimensional, it's a volume element instead of, instead of a picture element. And these are called voxels. These voxels are pretty small. They're like usually three millimeters by three millimeters by three millimeters. So very small. Um, and so we have within a human brain, if we think about this encapsulating the whole brain, there will be hundreds of thousands of voxels, okay? Now, the other piece to keep in mind here is this repetition time or TR. The TR, the repetition time, is the time that passes between one scan of the brain to the next scan of the brain. And the TR these days is usually two to two and a half seconds. 
which means that every two, two and a half seconds, we get a whole picture of the brain, yeah? which may seem quite fast, but I'll explain in a minute why it's actually not so fast. So what happens at the end of all of this is that we get at each voxel, at each brain location, we get what's called a time series. This time series here shows the bold response that I explained before. And so for instance, if these red pieces are say one condition and that might be, oh, just, just resting and the blue places are a different condition. So for instance, that flashing checkerboard that I talked about before, then we can see, oh, at this voxel location. So this would be the time series for one voxel. When it's at in the low condition, this is what it looks like. When it's in the flashing checkerboard condition, this is what it looks like and so on. So it goes up and down across the, the time of the experiment, okay? So we have from one voxel, this is what our data look like. And we have hundreds of thousands of series like this, one for each location in the brain. So that's the data that we're, that we're having to work with. And this would be for a single subject. So, in terms of the qualities or the characteristics of the data that we're working with, these data have high spatial resolution because the voxels are on a millimeter scale. Still compared to neurons, that's big, but compared to other types of imaging, this is a very good spatial resolution. They have low temporal resolution. I said before that that TR, that time to repetition that we get, the time that it takes us to get the whole scan, is two, two and a half seconds, which again may seem fast, but things in the brain happen much, much faster than that. They happen on the millisecond scale, not on the second scale. And so if it's taking you two minutes, two seconds, excuse me, two seconds to get a complete scan, then there's a lot of information that you're missing. And so they have low temporal resolution. They're big data because they have large size in many of the dimensions that we can think about. There's a spatial dimension, that's the voxels, of which we have hundreds of thousands of voxels in a brain. There's the temporal, that length of that time force, which will typically be hundreds of time points. And so again, those are big. But typically and historically, they have been small in the number of subjects, okay? And so collecting these data, time consuming, expensive, you have to buy, research, researchers have to buy time on the magnet and that costs hundreds of dollars per hour. And so it's hard to collect the data for some populations that you might be interested in studying, for instance, um, children with autism or people with schizophrenia or drug users or whatever, it might be hard to recruit subjects as well. And so the number of subjects is typically small, historically, okay? So fMRI data are a prototypical example of big data and a very early one as well, because people have been working with these types of data for more than for 30 years now, roughly. And this was before we had the big astronomical data and other, other types that we have now very commonly, but they were an early example and still an example of big data. So we have lots and lots of, of data here that we need to wrangle. Okay, now, Statistician, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about statistics, but nothing too technical. If anyone's interested in details of any of these things, you know, I'd be happy to handle that in questions. Traditional statistics is built for a situation where the number of observations that you have is greater than the number of variables or the number of questions that you have. And so we call this N greater than P. N is the number of observations, P is the number of variables or questions. And so N is greater than P. We have enough information to answer our question. So for example, a lot of statistics came out of agricultural applications. And so a simple type of uh, example of a question in traditional statistics might be, does this fertilizer increase crop yield? And so you might have you know, 30, um, 30 plots say, or make it simpler, even simpler, 30 little buckets and each one has a plant in it, and to half of them you apply the fertilizer, and to the half of the half of them you don't, and so then you have, and then you measure the yield, okay? So here you have a single question, that's the crop yield, and you've got 30 pieces of information to help you answer that question. With big data statistics, this often flips, not always, but often. In big data statistics, 
the number of variables or questions is potentially much, much larger than the number of observations. And so here we say P greater than N. Sometimes you'll hear this described as large P, small N, meaning you don't have enough subjects, you don't have enough pieces of information necessarily to answer all the questions that you're interested in. So what do you do? Okay, so that's one characteristic of our big data situation. Some other characteristics of functional MRI data in particular is that they're really quite complicated. So they're complicated in, in a couple of different ways. So I say here that they're complicated in their spatial structure. That means what's the relationship between what happens at one of those voxel locations and what happens at other voxel locations? I need to take that into account because they clearly are sort of working together in some way. Also, those time points, uh, that time series at each voxel, the image that I take at one time point seems like it should have some effect maybe on what happens at another time point. So how do I account for that? So I've got this complicated structure, um, which makes it harder to analyze, like the statistical models that you need to use for these types of data are more complicated. The other aspect of them is that the data are noisy. Okay, so we put the person inside the scanner, which is this big magnet. There's lots of complicated um, physics and chemistry and biology going on in the background. But the end result is that the data that come out of the scanner are not usable in their raw form. They need to be cleaned up or pre-processed in some ways before I can even start to do any type of statistical analysis. And there are many, many, many pre-processing steps. And most of them can be carried out in different ways. So the researcher has some choices. How is she going to carry out this pre-processing step? And furthermore, they can also be sort of switched around. So some pre-processing steps have to happen at certain times, but other pre-processing steps can switch orders. And so some people have done calculations and have come to the conclusion that there are maybe thousands, if not tens of thousands of different ways that the data can be pre-processed. So this is before I even do any statistical analysis. This is just cleaning up the data. There are thousands of different ways that I can do that. And again, historically, there's no universally agreed upon pathway, which means that every lab, a lab here at Penn State will do things in some particular way. A different lab here at Penn State may do them in a different way. And a lab over at Penn will do it even differently. And the people that I worked with at UGA before moving here will potentially have done it a different way as well. So everybody has their own favorite way of doing these, these pre-processing steps and, and it's not agreed on by everybody. So we'll come back to this point later on as well. Okay, so I've told you a little bit about the data. What kinds of things might we be interested in testing with, with this type of imaging technique? So they start off very simple. The simplest kind of question you might ask is which parts of the brain respond to a particular task or stimulus? So here's this is a very simple example of a type of test that you can do in the scanner. It's called the Stroop test. Um, we see here two words, the word green that's written in a blue font and the word blue that's written in a blue font. And the question is, you have to name the color of the font that the word is written in. Okay? Now, the first one where the word green is written in the color blue is called discongruent or incongruent because the two don't match, right? And so if I have to, so when I see the word green written in the color blue, and it's asking me what the color of the font is that the word is written in, I have to stop a second and think. It doesn't come so naturally. And the word blue written in the color blue is congruent because the two match. So you might, for instance, be interested in a simple question like that, which voxels in the brain react differently, respond differently to the incongruent words, to the congruent words? For some reason, you might be interested in a question like that. So that's just sort of a, what's called in the field, activation detection. You're looking for parts of the brain that are activated in response to a particular task or stimulus. Another question, sort of a, a next level question to this, might be how do those parts of the brain differ across different groups? So what we have here are what are called group maps. And this is just um, 
some way of combining the information from the individual maps of the subjects from three groups of people. We have patients, in this case, patients with schizophrenia. We have controls. So these are healthy people without schizophrenia. And in the middle, we also have a group of relatives, relatives of people with schizophrenia who themselves do not suffer from, from schizophrenia, okay? And we show that these maps show the areas of activation to a particular task for these three groups. And you can see, for instance, if you look at the patients compared to the relatives, compared to the controls, that the regions are roughly the same. So the, these red blobs, these different colored blobs here show the areas that are activated in response to whatever, whatever task they were doing. The regions are roughly the same. The blobs are roughly in the same place, but the blobs for the patients tend to be bigger and the blobs for the controls tend to be smaller and the blobs for the relatives tend to be sort of in between. We also see that there are some blobs like this one here and this one here that the patients have and the other two groups look like they don't have. Okay, so we can have differences in sort of location of activation. We can have differences in extent of activation. And then the brightness and darkness of the colors show sort of intensity of the activation. And we can see that those are different as well. So what we'd like to do perhaps is take these pictures and quantify them in some way so that we can say, oh, this is how these groups differ from each other. Okay, so that's a different type of question we might be interested in. Third type of question that we might be interested in has to do with building up brain networks. And this is probably the most popular type of question nowadays, and it's also the hardest in a way to think about and to address. So we're looking at how do the parts of the brain interact and how do those interactions differ across groups? And so here, for instance, we see uh, a net network from people with high creativity, network for people with lower creativity, and we see, oh, here's different regions of the brain. And we can sort of see, well, with the low creative network, there's lots more connections um, than there is in the high creative network. Some of the connections are the same. Some of them are different. If we draw them back on the brains as well, we can see some differences and some similarities. Again, how do we quantify those and draw statistical conclusions from them? Okay. So these are sort of prototypes of the types of questions that you might be interested in exploring with functional MRI and other types of neuroimaging data. Okay, now for something completely different. I'd like to move on to a somewhat famous, um, infamous study called the Dead Salmon, it's actually called the Dead Salmon Study. Um, and it's uh, 20, 20, 2009, uh, first poster and then paper by Bennett et al. So to give you a little bit of background to this Dead Salmon Study, one of the things that people will do um, when they're setting up a machine, one of these MR scanners, or if they're just testing some new protocols, is they'll, they'll do some kind of calibration just to make sure that the machine is working the way that they want it to. And so one of the ways that you can do calibration is to put what's called a phantom inside the scanner instead of a person. So the phantom could just be, it's usually just like a ball filled with water or with some kind of gel, and you don't expect to have anything um, so you don't expect to pick up any signal because there's no signal to pick up. It's just a way of exploring whether the machine is working the way it's supposed to. For some reason, and I don't remember the reason now, Bennett and his colleagues decided to do this calibration with a dead fish instead of with a regular phantom. Okay, so they bought a salmon from their fish market and they brought it into their lab and they scanned it and they put it in the scanner. So they put this dead salmon in the scanner and they showed it images of people in different situ social situations. And the question posed to the dead fish in the scanner was, what are the people feeling? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they feeling awkward? Are they scared? Whatever, okay? And then they did it, you know, again, just for calibration purposes. But again, for some reason, they decided to take the data that were collected, analyze them as if it was a real study. So they just used common methods of analysis and they found what looked to be active voxels in the brain of the dead fish. Here's the image that they had. And so you can see this is a dead fish. There should be no brain activation because it's a dead fish. And yet when they analyzed the data using common analysis techniques, these little red ones, these little red dots here 
are like the red blobs that we saw in the previous pictures. These are areas where it looked like there was something going on. Now, they did this to highlight the challenges of big data analysis. And in fact, all of these are what are called in statistics false positives. Okay, so I'll explain in a second what a false positive is a little bit more um, concretely, but intuitively you can think about a false positive as exactly this situation, right? The fish was dead, there's nothing going on in its brain, but yet when I do the analysis, it looks like I find something. Okay, so clearly it's a mistake. Okay, and the type of mistake that it is is a false positive mistake. So here again, we have a little bit of statistics. And for the statisticians in the audience, just like earlier, I should have apologized to any physicists or chemists or biologists in the audience for simplifications I was making on the MRI side. Here, for any statisticians in the audience, I hope you'll forgive me for any simplifications that are coming in here as well. Roughly, we can think about all of our observations, all of our data sort of falling into one of these four categories. We can think about there being some true state. And here I have two possibilities. I could have a quote unquote active voxel. That means this is one of those voxel locations that is responding differently to the stimulus compared to whatever background brain activation there might be. And I could, or I could have an inactive voxel. Those are really, again, in sort of a simplification, those are really my two possibilities. The voxel's responsive or it's not responsive. I don't know which it is, of course. And so the way, the way that I get at this traditionally is to do some kind of statistical test or statistical analysis. And based on the result of that test, I'm gonna reach some decision. I'm gonna say, oh, I think this voxel is an active voxel, or I think this voxel is an inactive voxel. And so if I think about the true states and my two decisions, then I have four possibilities. I could say, my test could tell me, oh yes, I think this is an active voxel and it could truly be an active voxel. And then I call it a true positive because that's something that's real and I found it. So I'm gonna focus on the true ones first. I could have a truly inactive voxel and the result of my test says, yeah, that's an inactive voxel. And then I've got that right, right as well. It's a true negative. But I can also make mistakes. I make a false positive when the true state is that it's an inactive voxel, but my statistical test tells me it's active. Then I found something that's not really there. That's a false positive. So that's what I see in the dead salmon study, right? Everything there, here's a, here's a case where I know everything was inactive because it was a dead fish, okay? But yet I still, as a result of my statistical test, apparently was finding something that looked like active voxels. So those have to be false positives. The other kind of mistake I can make is a false negative where there's an active voxel, but my statistical test says inactive. And then what happens is there's something there, but I've missed it. I failed to discover something that's there. So the one, the false positive discovers something that's not there. The false negative fails to find something that is there. And those are both mistakes. And I will never know in any given situation whether I'm making one of these mistakes or not. And if I am, which one I am making, okay? Because I just, I don't know the truth. So this is what happens. And what I would like to do ideally is I'd like to minimize the probability, the chances that I make both of those types of mistakes. I want, I don't want to be in a situation where I have a high probability of making a false positive decision. I don't want to be in a situation where I have a high probability of making a false negative decision. I'd like both of those chances to be small. Unfortunately, because of the way statistical tests work, if my, the, the amount of data or my sample size is fixed, the two trade off. The only way I can make my probability of making one type of error smaller is to increase my probability of making the other one. Big. So if the sample size is fixed, that's all I can do. So one thing I can do instead is try to, to say control. So in statistics, we call this controlling the probability of making each of the types of error. And so the types of statistical tests that you may have learned in an AP stat course or an intro stat course are used because 
they control the, that trade-off in, in an optimal way or in a good way for a particular sample size. Now, this table that I've shown you is for doing one test, one statistical test isolated on its own, and I can control those probabilities. But we've just been talking about fMRI, where I've got hundreds of thousands of voxels. And each one of those voxels, I'm going to do a test like this. And so I'm doing hundreds of thousands of statistical tests, not just a single statistical test. And I do one at each of those voxel locations. So what is the impact or the implication of doing this? Uh, so, OK, this is a nice big screen, so you can see this. Um, XKCD, if you're not familiar with, I've got to give a great plug. Um, lots of fun cartoons, comics about science, about math, and about statistics. And this particular one is about a very um, common, important, tragic, I don't want to write the right adjective for it, statistical problem. And so in the first panel, we've got a question. Do, um, do jelly beans cause acne? Okay, so the researchers have to go off and check it. And they say, no, no evidence that um, jelly beans cause acne because, and here in parentheses, P greater than 0.05. P is, uh, stands for p-value. P greater than 0.05 means it hasn't attained some threshold that allows me to make this decision, as it were, about an effect or no effect. Next, it's like, wait, that doesn't sound right. Well, maybe it's not all jelly beans. Maybe it's just some colors of jelly beans. So go test that. So we try one color, nope, one color, nope, a different color, nope, whole bunches of colors until finally at the end, after trying all of these different colors, green jelly beans, they find an effect. And that is what appears in the paper. Hidden behind all of this is that my original test for all jelly beans said there's nothing going on. And all of the other 19 that I did said there was nothing going on, but I found one that did. And that's the one that gets publicized. This is a small scale version of the dead salmon problem. So again, a little bit more statistics. Hope you'll bear with me. And then we will move away from that. The traditional way, and this is true in fMRI, this is true in this example here from XKCD with the jelly beans, that people make this decision about is there something happening here or not, is active or inactive, is to use what's called statistical significance of results. This is based on that kind of threshold that I mentioned just a second ago, that P greater than 0.05 or P less than 0.05, which is related in some way to the probability of making a false positive. But again, this is for a single test. So what happens is when you do a single test, you can sort of control things. But when you do a lot of tests, you have to be sort of more careful about how you do it because you have to control those probabilities over all of the tests. This Bennett study, the dead salmon study, was actually, it seems kind of sort of frivolous, but it was made, coming to make this very serious point that if you don't control things in the right way, you're going to get nonsensical um, results. And even in 2009, this message that Bennett and colleagues were trying to send was not new. People have been writing about this in the context of fMRI, including me and some of my colleagues, for more than 10 years. The, the papers that people still cite about this, they were all written, almost all of them were already written. This was known in the literature, and yet you could still read many, many papers in the fMRI literature where they were not making these corrections, which meant that they were potentially making a lot of discoveries that were these false positives. They weren't really there because they weren't doing the statistical control appropriately. So Bennett and colleagues kind of took this to an extreme by saying, OK, let's image this dead fish and apply this type of analysis that lots and lots of people do and show concretely where you can go wrong. That was exactly their point. OK, so now this brings me to my second main theme um, of today, of this morning's talk. And this has to do with chatter that's in the air in recent years about maybe a reproducibility crisis in science. And maybe you've heard about some of this as well. Um, terminology 
is still kind of fluid. You'll hear people talk about reproducibility and you'll hear people talk about replicability. And in different fields, they use these terms in different ways. I am using here the definitions uh, in, from a National Academy of Sciences report that was put out a few years ago. And so in that report, they talk about reproducibility and replicability as, and defined in these, in these two ways. So reproducibility says, if I give you my data and my code that I use to analyze those data, will you get the same results? That sort of seems like a very low bar and should be a no brainer. Obviously that should always work, but it actually doesn't. And then replicability is what people I think often think about when they talk about a reproducibility crisis. That is, if you're using different data, but you're asking similar questions, do you get consistent results? Okay, so again, Different fields will use reproducibility and replicability in slightly different ways, but I tend to follow the, this National Academy of Sciences report. And so in this talk, this is how I'm gonna be using these two terms. And in recent years, there have been some high profile cases, many, many high, profo pro high profile cases of failures to replicate. I'm gonna talk just briefly about a few of those to give you a sense of what this looks like. So, I mentioned earlier the Center for Open Science. Um, not only are they a great resource for all things related to open science, they also do research of their own. And they have had two, so far, very high profile studies. One is called um, Open Science Framework Reproducibility Project in Psychology. Here, they, use re they say reproducibility, but they mean replicability in the way that I'm using it. And they tried here to replicate findings from 100 psychology experiments. So they found a bunch of things. The probably the most um, important one for today is that the effect sizes that they found in the replications were almost all smaller than the original effect. So you read in, again, you know, you read in the paper, huge effect of something, 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 this, this um, whatever phenomenon. But then when you come to replicate it, it's much less. Okay? And then there's some other things about, about whether results were statistically significant or not. But in general, they concluded that there was not re great replication in psychology. Okay. They also did a project in cancer biology. And here as well, they aim to replicate findings from 193 experiments in 53 high impact papers published over three years. If you look at their summary, you can see what they're really upfront about the challenges that they faced. So for instance, it was not sufficient detail in the reports. So this brings us to the open science theme as well. Researchers were not sharing their data, even though, they, even though in many cases they said, if you want to see our data, contact us and we'll give you our data, but they wouldn't, or they wouldn't respond, okay? So it was hard to even do the replication study because they didn't have enough information. But here as well, they found that replication effect sizes were smaller, only about half of the results were replicated. And interestingly, the original positive results, so things that looked like they were findings, were less likely to replicate, so probably they were false positives, than original null results, which said there's nothing to see here. Okay, so there's differences, and this has to do a little bit with incentives because um, science likes to publish splashy new results and is not necessarily so interested in sort of, oh, no finding. Bringing it a little bit more concrete, yet still. So here is a high profile specific example of a phenomenon that failed to replicate. It's called the power pose. So I found this uh, little cartoon on a website of San Mateo County, California. And it's a website that was aimed at helping teenagers find jobs. And it's like, how do you prepare for a job interview? And one of the things that they say is do a power pose, okay? So the idea with power pose is that if you're a little nervous before, before something that you strike this powerful pose, right? Like, and that's gonna give you confidence, okay? So this paper was published in 2010. It claimed that the power pose, as I said, increases confidence. Also, more than that, not just that it increased confidence sort of in some vague way, but that it also affected the hormone levels and specifically that it led to an increase in testosterone, 
and a decrease in cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone that is related to stress. And so it was like a decrease of cortisol. This led to a book for the main researcher on the this, on this study, a TED talk that has been viewed millions and millions of times and failures to replicate. This was such a high profile finding that people wanted to see, does it work in this situation, that situation with depopulations? And it wasn't replicated. Um, eventually, one of the original researchers from that first paper disassociated herself and said, I don't believe this is true anymore. Um, but it's really kind of unclear. There has been work in the years after this to say, well, maybe it does increase confidence in kind of a sort of a placebo effect sort of way. They think it's going to make you more confident, so you feel more confident. There's not been, as far as I'm aware, as much evidence replicating the hormonal changes, which is a physiological thing. And so it's really unclear. Is the power pose really a genuine phenomenon or not? So there have been lots of the, and then this is just one example, and there's there's plenty of others of sort of high profile studies or high, high profile sort of clusters of, of research that have failed to replicate. And so there, been, there was a survey a few years ago asking scientists whether they thought there was a replication crisis, and the vast majority said that they thought that there was. Okay, so this is in general. What about bringing it back to neuroimaging? Well, in neuroimaging, I hope that I've sort of convinced you because of the big data problem and these other pieces of information that I brought in, that there are many, many barriers to reproducibility and replicability. I've already mentioned there's lots of different ways of performing this pre-processing, and if researchers are not crystal clear about how they performed each of those steps, then I have no chance of reproducing their work, which ties into the second point, a lack of clarity in reporting, which the um, cancer biology researcher replication project also found. There's just not, people just don't put enough detail about exactly what they've done. Furthermore, in the context of neuroimaging, there are not, it's not just that they don't have, that we don't, we don't have sort of standard pre-processing streams. We also don't have standardized ways of uh, sort of storing the data or reporting on the data. Okay, so everything is kind of, it's getting better and this, this will come in, in later. Um, but, but sort of traditionally and historically, every researcher kind of stored the data the way that they wanted to, reported things the way that they wanted to, and there wasn't any kind of uniformity. And so for somebody kind of trying to come in and use somebody else's data, it was really, really hard to do. And then again, of course, this problem of false positives that I talked about before, because false positives, well, they're not real findings, and so they're less likely to replicate or not likely to replicate. Okay, so this is what's going on in neuroimaging. And we have in the neuroimaging world, both types of problems, this reproducibility and replicability. So there've been a couple of studies that I think are really interesting. Um, a couple of studies have shown that you can take, you can take sort of standard software that people use to analyze um, fMRI data. And if you run it on a different platform, so Mac versus Linux versus Windows, for instance, or different versions of Mac OS or different versions of the software, you can get different results. Some of this has to do with kind of rounding errors, which may be small at any stage, but they accumulate over the multiple stages of the analysis. At the end of the day, you have different results. Another uh, recent study gave groups all around the world. Basically, to participate in this project, all you had to do was contact the researchers and say that you were interested in participating. They had data set they made available to all these different groups. They said, okay, here's the data. Here are the scientific questions we would like you to answer. Go ahead, analyze the data in the ways that you want to, and then report back to us. And so here they weren't saying analyze the data in a particular way, but everybody was starting with the same data sets and the same scientific questions. And even there, so using different analysis paths, you get two different results. So there's no consistency there either. So these are problems of reproducibility. But as I mentioned already, and I'll sort of pound on this point yet again, there are also problems of rep replicability coming from our large number of tests combined with all of these different pre-processing paths that we can put into place. 
And so we have problems of replicability as well, which means that you know, things that I think I'm finding, I'm not necessarily gonna find in further studies. So is it time for reform? And here I'm gonna get a little bit on a soapbox um, because I'm firmly in the camp of those that believe it is time for reform. And this is on two different fronts. First front, first front reform is in terms of open science. Already mentioned, wanna kind of bring this up again. Open science is the movement to make scientific research open, transparent, and accessible to all. There are three pillars of open science. I'm only gonna talk about the first two here today. First one is open data, second one is open code, and the third is open publication. So data has to do with sharing your data and they should adhere to what are called the FAIR principles. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Lots of words, basically the idea is just to say, if I put my data set out there for public use, then, the, then people should be able to find it and they should be able to use it, which means it needs to be documented well enough. It can't rely on some kind of specialist software that my graduate student wrote to open it. It needs to be usable, okay? So the data is not enough to put it up on some repository, it has to be usable. Open code, same idea. If I put my code out there, I can put it up on GitHub, very popular thing to do these days, but if someone coming along from outside can't understand my code because they haven't documented it well, or it relies on some piece of specialist software, or it relies on a particular version of the programming language that I'm using, and I haven't said which one, then again, it's not really open in a, in a usable way. So GitHub is a way of getting it out there. Docker is a way of preserving the environment of my, compu my computing environment so that you can use it as well. Open publications is sort of a bigger topic um, that has to do with this new-ish modality of publishing, which is called open access publishing. I'll talk about that just a tiny little bit um, later on, but I'm not gonna focus on it too much. And again, if people are interested about any of these, I'll we'll be glad to discuss more later. Okay, so a little bit about what's happening um, in terms of open neuroimaging on the data front. So people realized all of these problems and now there are repositories that are in existence for publicly sharing data. And there are repositories on things like Alzheimer's disease, adolescent development, um, a project that's called Connectomes, which is for network data. So it's doing these types of network analyses that I mentioned earlier on, and lots and lots of others. So now there are many, many repositories of open data in the neuroimaging field. They include fMRI data, which I've talked about, but also some of them include other types of imaging data as well, some of which are structural. So they talk about the brain structure, not just the function um, and different types of diseases, healthy development and so on. So lots of going on here. Open data leads to increases in sample sizes, right? Because if I put my data in there, so suppose I do a study on schizophrenia, I put my data in there, another group, someplace else also doing a study on schizophrenia, puts their data in and another group and so on. So suddenly now I don't just have my own, however many number of subjects I was able to recruit, but I have potentially hundreds or thousands of subjects. And yes, there are issues about whether, you know, everything kind of matches up, but that's a statistical challenge that we can potentially deal with. Okay, so open data gives us more sample sizes which leads us to what I'm starting to call now bigger big data. So regular functional MRI was big data, except it had that problem, if you remember back at the beginning, that the number of subjects was small. And that was kind of my barrier. But now with open data, I get rid of that barrier as well. So I have bigger big data. And I think this is going to have positive implications for replicability. In terms of open code, um, especially in the last five years or so, the field has been moving towards standardizing many of these things that I've talked about that have not been standard up to this point. So for instance, pre-processing pipelines or file structures, which makes it easier to share. Um, 
there have been a couple of reports and recommendations from the leading brain imaging societies about openness and details. So it's not just openness, but you also need to have that detail in reporting your analysis pipelines and your decisions. I chose to do these pre-processing steps in this order, in this way, so that when the next person comes along, they can do exactly what I did. I did my statistical analysis in this way, and I made these choices. And so again, the next person can, can replicate that. Again, this is going to have, it's already having positive implications for both reproducibility and replicability. The more detail I give, the more open I am in sharing what I've, what I've done, it's gonna be easier for other people to do that. And so with, with these improvements in reproducibility and replicability, my findings hopefully will end up being more stable and more reliable. So that is one side of the reform that has to do with open science. The second side of the reform is what I'm going to call statistical reform. And this came about kind of because of all of these other conversations that were happening around reproducibility and replicability and failures to replicate. And within the statistical community, people, some people started wondering whether some of these problems were related to misunderstanding and misuse of some statistical concepts like those p-values that I mentioned earlier. And related to that, this reliance, some would say over-reliance on this notion of statistical significance that I mentioned earlier as well. So these are two main sort of tools that people use not when they're, when they're doing statistical analysis and applying statistical tests. So in 2016, the American Statistical Association, ASA, came out with what's now known as the ASA Statement on P-Values, which talked about common misunderstandings and misinterpretations of these P-values and sort of offered ways that maybe this could be improved. In, a few years later, in 2019, there was a special issue of one of our society journals, the American Statistician, um, on moving to a world beyond P less than 0.05. So again, that 0.05 threshold is often used as the deciding point for whether you think that there's an effect there or not. This special issue included 43 papers written mostly by statisticians, but by others as well, reflecting a variety of views about statistical inference and statistical analysis, how it should be carried out. I was one of the co-authors on the lead editorial to that special issue, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, the whole issue is available. We made a, uh, an agreement with the publisher that the whole issue would be available online, open access forever, everywhere in the world. So anybody can read any of those papers in that special issue for free always. And then in reaction to some of this other stuff in 2021, uh, the, the then ASA president put together a task force on statistical significance and replicability, and they had a short report as well. So what's this all about? So in our editorial to the special issue, we advocated basically shifting away from this dichotomous thinking. So I, in that, if you think back to that table that I had earlier with the result of the statistical test as being either active or inactive, the way you get to that is by dichotomizing your statistical results. So we're saying, don't do that anymore. Don't threshold statistical quantities, don't have this dichotomous thinking, and don't make declarations of statistical significance or lack thereof. Instead, we advocated for what we call the atomic principles. Um, some would say, because we're trying to blow everything up, but um, this is what it stands for. So we want to accept uncertainty, we want to be thoughtful, open, and modest. So these three here um, relate to the open science reform that I was talking about before. And then finally, institutional change, changing the incentives, changing the way that we do things. So these kinds of conversations are not new. I always like to, when I give this kind of talk to a statistics audience, I always like to pull out quotations from statisticians of the past talking about these exact same issues that I've been talking about, many of the exact same issues I've been talking about today. And they've been saying this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 70 years. And 
calls for statistical reform, transparency, sharing of information. This has been going on for a really long time. So why do we think that this time might be different? Well, I'm, I'm sort of cautiously optimistic, I guess I'll say, because I feel like the open science movement and the movement for statistical reform, these are twinned movements and they have similar goals. And at different times we've had maybe one of them happening and maybe the other, but I think it's kind of rare that both of them are happening together and with such force. The other thing is, that this is in a very large way a grassroots movement. This is coming from scientists and practitioners themselves, people who have been frustrated with the way that things have been traditionally done in their fields and are looking for ways to do sort of enhanced statistical analysis, more meaningful, and then also this idea of bringing in this openness and this transparency. Some journals are starting to change their editorial policies. So towards open science, for instance, requiring or strongly recommending that people share their data and share their code as a, as a part of publication. Also statistical reform. Some journals are saying they no longer want to have statements of statistical significance in the results, for instance. And there are some other editorial changes that are also happening um, that might lead to sort of a more global change. Funding agencies and governments are also starting to promote open science. Um, so just a couple, couple here, NSF, NASA, NIH starting next week, um, people applying for NIH grants, National Institute of Health grants, are going to have to include in their proposal a data management and sharing plan. It doesn't say that you have to share all of your data, but you have to have a plan for what you're gonna do to make data available. And if you're not sharing your data, you need to explain why you won't be able to share it. So if things are confidential or sensitive and you don't wanna share it, so there are ways not to, but, but NIH is gonna re start requiring people to be more upfront about it. Um, on the US government side, over the summer, there was an executive order from the White House that research that is funded, publicly funded, so from NSF, NIH, NASA, other types of funding agencies like that, those, the, the papers that come out of those projects will need to be made openly available to the public as, as soon as possible, as, as immediately as possible. So no longer having embargoes on publications and so on. And the US is a little bit behind on some of these things. In Europe, many countries are much more ahead uh, on the open science front than we are, but things are starting to move here as well. So, I guess my optimism is coming from a combination of all of these things together. Our bigger big data that we're getting as a result of open science, the transparency that we're getting as a result of open science, our more nuanced statistical practice coming from the statistical reform that some of us are advocating. And the hope is that all of these things coming together will lead to enhanced replicability and, rep rep and reproducibility. I don't know that they will, hence the question mark, but I hope that they will. Okay, so to tie things together, open data, it boosts our sample sizes because we're sharing information. This should lead to enhanced replicability. Functional neural imaging has been the example that I've been using throughout the talk as my example of big data, but this applies um, in other fields as well, and you'll be hearing more about this in subsequent weeks. If we shift away from this dichotomous statistical thinking that comes along with notions of statistical significance, we, we will get a more nuanced view of our scientific results, which should also lead to enhanced replicability. And again, we're starting already to see some of this synergistic effect, things kind of playing off each other in functional neural imaging studies, which are the ones that I am most familiar with in this field. So I will thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions.